Welcome to the Touching Into Presence podcast. This podcast is for people who are interested in body work, empowerment, and somatic based practices. I am Nikki Olson. I'm Andrew Rosenstock. We are certified Rolfers. Collectively, we're trained in various movement and bodywork therapies with an emphasis on somatic awareness and client resilience. Through conversations, our goal is to share and explore mind-body paradigms to offer empowerment possibilities. It was such a pleasure to be in conversation with Margaret van der Waarden and Alice Arbeninchik. Today's talk is a little different than our usual talks as we're in conversation about former Rolfer, actor, and artist John Lodge. A new book has come out from the European Guild for Structural Integration about John and the work he was given from Dr. Ida Rolf. In our conversation, we speak about who John Lodge was, how he came to the work, and what marvels he has left behind that have both turned into this book and a few other things coming on the way. I can't recommend this book enough as you're here in this episode. So with that, let's begin our talk. That sounds great. Sounds great. So with that, Margaret, since you were married to this so-called man named John Lodge, that uh-huh. people listening have no idea maybe who he is, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about him? Well, uh, he uh, was born in California, and he originally wanted to be an actor, but in World War II, he was drafted, and he became a uh, B-17 pilot. Those are the guys that did those bombing runs, and huge percentage didn't live. Uh, so they were required to do 25 missions, but he did 35 missions. He volunteered for an extra 10, which tells a lot about him. Um, he, he got the Distinguished Flying Cross, two Purple Hearts, and he was shot down over Belgium, one of his uh, missions, and he had to parachute out of the plane, and he experienced chronic pain after that incident, Rest, until he was wrong. He told me after his sixth session, that pain went away and never came back. That was one thing that really, you know, was significant for him. Um, when he got out of World War II, he got a master's degree in arts, fine arts, and he started teaching art at the University of Michigan. He was quite an artist. He painted, and um, he painted his whole life at the very end. Uh, then he, he decided to go for acting because originally that was his love, and he lived in Hollywood for quite a while. Um, he was in Bonanza. He was in a number of things, uh, but he never made it, you know, really big the way he wanted to. So he ended up moving to Florida and opened a tackle shop because uh, he was big on fishing, love fishing. He was still doing commercials, and he was married to an actress then. And I think because of his back injury, she was seeking things for him to help him, and. Uh, and she was the original one that was curious about Rolfing and told him that she wanted to invite Ida Rolf for dinner um, the night before this demo she was going to do. So she came to their home for dinner and they had this party, a great party, apparently. And she was looking at his art and she shook his hand at the end of that dinner. And I believe that she picked him to be a rolfer at, at that time. She, she, and she found her artist. I, I, I truly believe that. Margaret, just for clarification, this was in Florida, correct? This is in Florida. So yeah, I'm just putting a timeline that this makes sense a little bit with another talk we had where we had uh, uh, Jim Asher. Jim Asher was on when he was talking about the few times that Ida was in Florida and she was setting something up there. So it's just really interesting to have the puzzle pieces of that Florida trainings that was going on and tying that into to meeting John there. And I, I think actually Jim may have even mentioned John in that. Unfortunately, the audio of that didn't come out great, but all right, that's just helpful to place a timeline and everything. Yeah, thanks. So at that demo, so then so he went to the demo. After the demo, all these people were going up to Ida Rolf, you know, amazed by what they saw and saying, um, you know, who would make a good Rolfer and wanting to learn Rolfing. And she pointed across the room at him and, and said that, that was a rolfer that I can't remember exact words, but she pointed at him and he couldn't believe she was pointing at him because he <laughs> wasn't, you know, he was an artist and an actor. He wasn't thinking about becoming a rolfer, but uh, I don't, Margaret, I don't can you clarify 
Is it because Ida Rolf is n- notorious for picking her early trainees right. because of their hands? So yes. was it the hands or his I was both the artistic mind that she was drawn to? I think it was both. And he was very metaphysical and spiritual. His art was, she was drawn to the mystical and metaphysical and it's all in his art. And she was looking for an artist. So I think, yeah, she was very drawn to him and yeah, picked him and, and he followed. (laughs) Dropped everything and did that. Yeah. So he worked, he did the drawings for three years and I, he didn't really tell me this, but uh, Emmett told me that, she was constantly pulling him out of class to work on the drawing. So he missed a lot of class. And I think that gave him a little bit of an insecurity, actually. You know, but he was having to learn through the drawings more. I don't know. But he was an awesome role. Just hearing that makes me think about one of the things in the book that we'll, we'll get to a little later. I think it was Hancock who, who, uh, who said that, you know, she was the one who was picked. Not to even know anatomy. Uh, one, one of the Ida like um, projects where she was trying to you know do things a little different. So very well, very well, maybe I'm just putting this bigger thing that Ida was like, you know, your drawing will teach you what you need to know. That you'll see it in the drawings. You don't need to be in the class to necessarily see. That's just how my mind is working right now within that. Yeah, he thought that she was handpicking people at the beginning, like kind of like what Nikki said, and and that. Uh, she was drawn to picking some people that thought totally different, saw totally different artists, um, different, not medical minds. She wasn't so interested in medical minds. She wanted people to think out of the box. So, um, yeah, he worked on the drawings for three years. Uh, the book was published, and he was living in California. Then he moved up to Washington State. Oh, no. So I, I think when he was living in Washington State is when he was teaching at the Law Institute. He was and, on the board. And Margaret, I think she was pretty, pretty tough with him with the drawings, wasn't she? That he would have to redo them again and again and again until until they were really as precise as she, as she wanted them to be. Is that? Yes, well, she, she would make him do drawings over and over again. Um, <laughs> and he was deaf all night because that's John. He's super intense. He was super intense. And uh yeah, he was so patient to <laughs> to do those things. But when you look at the drawings, they're really absolutely amazing. You know, he drew those. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, Ida Rolf was tough on him. But he just loved her. He just absolutely loved her. And uh, yeah, I think they had a great relationship. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's it's something you mentioned, and again, we may chat about this later, but he was teaching for, he was one of the instructors at the Rolf Institute, is, is what it sounds like. Right. Yeah, and there's this famous thing that he did, his first class, he came in front of the class completely naked, he wanted to be totally open with his class, which, <laughs> you know, I he never told me this, which tells, I don't know what that means exactly, but uh, I know that. After World War II, he had terrible psoriasis on his body. His body was covered in his plaques. He was very self-conscious about it. And for him to expose himself like that was really a big deal. When I heard that, I was like, wow. But that's John. That tells you a lot about his personality. I'm just I know Alesh has been teaching classes right now. I'm just wondering right now if he's going to implement any of that into his his coursework the next few days. <laughs> I, I have a feeling this is more something that used to happen in the 60s and 70s, much more than today. Today, there's a different, there's a different form of people. It also, yeah. it, explain, it explains maybe why your students have been buying you shirts is they really don't want to see underneath it. <laughs> yeah, John was a bit of a character, for sure. So... Um, yeah, yeah, please go on. So I guess I'll just tell tell you, I, I met him in uh, 1987. Uh, he had quit working for the Institute, I think in 85. I'm not sure how long he taught. Uh, but I met him by going to him for a rolfing pen series. And um, we just really connected. And we started dating right after my ten series. At the same time, I was starting a physical therapy practice. And I invited him to work with me, which he did. And then 
we started living together. We ended up getting married. And we got divorced. And then he continued to be a very close friend, I guess I could say. We were very, we have a very deep bond. And um, he worked with me until he had a stroke. And then my husband, Lee, and I, we took care of him until his last day. And during that time, of when he was uh, in a wheelchair, having had the stroke, uh, my husband was cleaning out the garage. Because we lived in the same house that John and I lived in. And so he had left quite a bit of stuff behind. And there was this box way up high on a shelf in a corner I never looked in because who looks in boxes and garages? And uh, he found it. And he, he recognized right away what it was. He's very familiar with roping. And um, he called me at work and he said, you're just not going to believe what I found in the garage. You're not going to believe. And he said, it's going to be a big surprise when I came home from work. So I come home, I'm all excited to see what this is. And I really couldn't believe it when I saw what it was. And that he had not told me. And that he had put it in the garage. Uh, it was also all his teaching notes. But I just was in awe of, especially the very first draft and the yellow pad with pencil. And her crossing things out. It's like an original thinker. You don't get to see their thoughts as you do in this original draft. It's to me absolutely mind blowing to have that in your hands. I mean, just and that's exactly I feel this is, what this is. Oh, sorry. Just for clarification, this is the draft of Ida Roth's book written by in her own hand, right? Yes, um, it's in her own hand with her beginning thoughts, and it's to have that. You don't get to see that in your life very often because there's not that many original thinkers that just create things out of nothing, you know? And I think that that's what's such a true treasure about this book yeah. is I feel like it's so beautifully organized and well written yes. that it exactly feels that way that we, especially, you know, you know, I've been a role for, for 20 something years. So I feel like, I'm kind of been in the game for a while, but certainly not from the very beginning. And yeah, I, as I'm reading it, I feel like I'm getting like transported back to the early days of the excitement around the work and the creativity of it all. And, and again, to reiterate, it feels, um, I feel like this is like the missing literature that what is needed in the, the structural integrated community because, you know, her book, Rolfing, Establishing the Natural Line and Rolfing and the Physical Reality, they're great books, but they're, they're like the anatomical, the, like the, the more kind of science behind the work where I feel like this book is really offering the spirituality around the work that has kind of just been talked about and not really documented. And I feel, I mean, I haven't read it um, cover to cover yet. I'm still in the kind of halfway through, but as I reading it, I'm like, Oh yeah, that this is what, this is speaking to what we hear about in our training or what we see in our practice is the, the, the spiritual phenomenon that's happening as people are, are getting structurally integrated. You take it in, uh, no matter what level you're coming from. It's like, I don't know, that book does something to you. It's I think before we even go a little more into the book, that there's there's a nice place in between, which is, so you've, you've found this stuff in your attic. Yes. Uh, and the, and there's, a, there's a big, as I understand it, a big something from, from that to getting to the book. There's a, there's a space in between. Yes. Um, so let's, let's talk about that if we can. Yeah, so I felt like I was really the keeper of this material. I was very, very serious about it. I was, and I asked John, he was still alive. I said, John, I found, we found this stuff. Oh, I can't believe you didn't tell me. And what do you want me to do with it? And he gave me his smile that he would make. And he said, you will know. That's what he said. So I, uh, we first thought we would approach the Smithsonian, actually. We thought it was so historical, but I was going by what I felt and that didn't feel right. 
and I approached a few people about it, I would just mention that I had it, see how they reacted, and, and no, no, nothing ever felt right. And then, um, so I was sitting there all this time. I would go through it once in a while. I never went through it the way Alice did, but uh, Alice was posting the three months of kind of review and videos. I, I don't really, I didn't even look at it that much till the very last part of it. I started paying more attention and it was dawning on me that this is the, the way John would like, have liked the, to see the work being carried on through what Alice was doing. And Alice asked for pictures of Ida Rolf on his last post, which I happened to read. And I had a photo album of photos of Ida Rolf. So I told him I did. And then I mentioned that I had, I think I told you I had the original drawings and the original draft of the book, correct, Alish? Yeah. And yeah. you didn't really say anything at first. And then you, you came back with an email asking me if I was looking, or was I looking for um, in, in telling you that? Was I looking to sell it? Was I looking to archive it? And I told you that I was looking for archiving. And um, just everything, everything about the way Alice responded, the enthusiasm that he had about it. And I knew they would honor this material. I just knew that this was the place where it should go. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to just interject something I didn't even know about because I... I mean, like what you're saying, it, it's it's so it's painting a bigger story in in my sphere because I I actually met Alesh around that time when he was posting those excerpts, and I, I found them really wonderful. And when I found out about this book, I actually in in my mind I thought all those excerpts that he was doing were from the material once I sort of put pieces together. But actually, what you're saying it, it, it really is that like what he was doing at that time which is still available online for those who want to search through it. It, it, it. it really is such a beautiful intersection between what became the book and, and all the stuff you found. So just to really paint that of like, you knowing when you will have the time and then seeing what, what he was doing, it, it's, it's really beautiful because it, it, it's, it's such a beautiful, I'm doing something with my hand and other people listening won't see, but it's this beautiful, like snug fit. Yeah, and then I had the, so, so okay, we agreed I would send it to him, and I was putting it together, and I had these other original things, uh, John's uh, notes, and, you know, I studied with Emmett, and I was exposed to John a lot, so for me, metaphysical, spiritual, and the work was totally, I got that, I mean, that's all I've been exposed to, so I didn't really understand how much it was missing from the original book, and, uh, I, I I just thought, well, these teachers in Europe could probably benefit from John's notes. These are teaching notes. They should be with teachers. And I had copies of them, but I decided to send the originals because his essence was in there. And I wanted all the original documents to be together. So I decided to send every original thing that I had. And then it appeared to me, Alish and his group put it together like, the metaphysics that John really understood and could articulate because he really could articulate. He was such a great speaker and he was, could articulate things. He was so intelligent. And so um, that's what I see Alish did was he put that all together. And John sort of gives a roadmap in the book, I think, to how you can work at a higher vibration and you can, you know, connect better with your clients. It's practical information. Yeah. yeah. Can articulate it. This was very difficult, I think. Well, I think from 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 our end, um when when Margaret came up with this with this idea that she had some material which had never been published, I asked the let's say the elders of our tribe, like David Davis, Neil Powers, and uh Nilsi Silveira, I told them about this and asked them, well, can we, what, what should we, what should Margaret do with it? And if she gave it to us, can we do something with it? And they, they basically said, uh, well, if it's been lying around for such a long time and she feels like this, we're the right people to have it, then we need to do something with it. You know, we can't just have it lying around in another 
a garage or storage place for another 30 years, we really need to do something with it. And so, I, you know, I asked around and, and asked our group who would be willing to work on this material with me. And there was four other people who immediately basically raised their hands and said, okay, we'll comb through this with you and we'll try and create a book about this material. Now, the original book by Ida Rolf, and I, 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 need, I think I need to mention this because I have a feeling many people haven't even read that book from, from what I sense in the community. It, the, the, it was an, an enormous task at the time. This was when it was published in 1975. And John Lodge made over 200 original drawings in that book. I mean, this is not just three pictures. There's two, more than 200 drawings in there, you know. And the whole, if I remember correctly, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the whole project of making that book took about four years. The drawings for three years, but yeah, I'm yeah. sure everything else it was four or five years, yeah. Right, right. And so when when I got this box, because I hadn't realized that either, you know, for me, I opened the book, Rolfing the Integration of Human Structures. I've read that book 10 times, but I've never thought about the process. I've never thought about how it was made. And then, then this book comes along and you see the enormity of work that people put into this. I mean, there is in, in that box was the first handwritten draft of the entire book written by hand, you know. And then you have five other versions which are typewritten. And hand corrected, you know, and recorrected and recorrected again. Um, you, I, I'm just in, you know, you, you must be in awe when you see that live, you know, and there was no other choice but to say, okay, somebody's done a lot of work here and has put their, their life blood into this project of publishing that book. Um, we need to somehow document this and, and the intention of, of uh, that book and maybe put in back a couple of pieces, which I think Nikki also mentioned, that spiritual part, which in the, in the last actual publishing of the book was, uh, let's put it this way, it was diminished a little bit. It was much larger in the, in the original material than, than what was then actually published. And the second publishing, it was even less. So to kind of put that soul of structural integration back into, into the thinking. Yeah, I think it was divine intervention. I mean, my God. I mean, it's amazing. I just I, love still, it. I still can't believe that this all happened and that John never felt he got acknowledged. And my God, look at this book. I mean, it's amazing. It's just absolutely amazing. It really Mark, is. Can you... Can you speak to why John, why it just was in a box, left kind of forgotten? Like, so I, I was thinking, why didn't I ask him? You know, I think there was some bitterness. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just guessing. He didn't talk a lot. He was a man in the present. He didn't like to talk about the past. And so I didn't press him. He didn't offer and did he stay, was he a rolfer um, yes. through the end? Or, I mean, did he pick up his... He had that stroke. Okay, so he he didn't depart from the work. He just... No, no. no he left it. those notes alone to be to be mysteriously found. Maybe that's part of his, his I don't know, obviously, his no, personality. Maybe he's I like, I'm going to leave a little treasure. Yeah, I think it was all supposed to happen like that. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit what you're saying. And, you know, I think a lot of it's about divine intervention may be a right way because, I, you know, I, my understanding is when Ida made her books, she was trying to make it more medical. She was trying to make it more, more mainstream. And at that time, spirituality wasn't necessarily mainstream. But nowadays, almost every corner has a yoga shop or, uh, you know, uh, um, I don't know, an ayahuasca center, whatever it is. And so there is more of a, an acceptance for that sort of work. And, you know, who knows? I'm getting a little more maybe esoteric to say, Ida knew that it it would come in. And so it, she wouldn't be able to do that. And John couldn't have done it then. But if we wait and let this, you know, grow, 
there will be a time when we can say, okay, now the now the the water is ready. Let's put the noodles in and cook. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Well, when you when you look at the material, you can literally sense the struggle within her. How much of the let's say esoteric stuff she really believed in can she put in a in a medical book, and how much does she need to leave out so that the book can be actually um, become more more commonplace for the for the average person who is not spiritual minded or be accepted, let's say, by the medical field even. There's, there must yeah. be an enormous, there must have been an enormous struggle within her. And, and it's so interesting. Like it's it's so interesting how it mirrors life. Because right now, in a few of the, the forums, there's just a big talk about what are we doing as rolfers? I mean, this is an old talk. If we're just doing tissue work, why aren't we just deep tissue massage therapists? And we're not. We're doing much more than just working on a a on a corporal, a, a physical. There's much more going on. So it's always just tying in. I really can't recommend the book enough. And that's why I posted about it to, to some other forums. And that's why we're having this talk is I, I do think it's, it's time. It's the right time. Exactly. With that, you know, we've, we've sort of, we have talked a little bit about how it came to about John, about how the, the writings were found, how the book came to be. Is there more that either you, Margaret or Alice want to share about the book? I mean, we don't want to give it all away because you, you don't want people to, to read it. Um, but is there more you do want to share about it or do you want to also maybe if not, do you want to transition to, you know, I think that as my understanding is there's also a lot of other material that isn't in the book that's housed in an archive in Alesh's apartment or a house somewhere. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you want to chat about that or. Let me, let me say, just speak two minutes about how we worked on it. I think every, every one of us who was involved and I suspect that many other people, too, who have gone through the basic series of Rolfi remember that series very well. The first time they were touched by either Rolf's work. And so many, many of us, I think, would um, call that first initial encounter with structural integration they, they would call it an initiation in some ways, initiation in the sense that you're introduced to something completely new, to a completely new way of thinking about yourself, um, which you, you've never encountered before. And this was at least the experience of all of us that worked on, on the material. And so, so we decided, let's, let's have everyone actually tell the original story of that initiation thus creating a bridge from the theory uh, that the material gives to uh, you know to an actual a practical experience every one of us had so as to not just leave this in the distant past somewhere with some esoteric thoughts around it but to put it really into into a practical experience that at least the people that worked on this on this material all had and so that's kind of the other side of that book is is the the you know actual um, encounters with structural integration that that some of us some of us had. And I think within that book it creates kind of a nice balance and a nice tension between the present and the past and the theory and the practical work um, that I think people will enjoy when they read it. I agree. Because I've, I've really enjoyed um, just hearing about uh, other practitioners that historically we've heard about. It's a lovely window of how other people have fell into the work. And their, their little historical contribution that they can offer that I don't think um, you don't always have a chance to hear through the right. greater community, unless, I mean, you normally right. hear little fun historical sound bites when you're going through your trainings, whether it's the Guild or the Rolf yeah. Institute or whoever. But I think you did a really great job of um, showcasing different stories from yeah. prominent. Well, what I, what I found that fascinating when I, when I read them is that everybody, everyone has their own style, uses different words. And they're very different in style, but everybody essentially tells the same story. Yes, 
being yes. introduced to something which is mind blowing. You know, and and that I found absolutely fascinating. You know, that people use different words, different styles to say the, exactly the same thing. It's, it's, I think, one of the things I really love about this work, having coming from other more, um, other other different modalities, is the, for lack of a better word, the art involved, that, yeah. that you have this real big canvas uh, to, to get these, the, the, this thing across, but there's so much interpretation involved. And it's one of the things I love you know, one of the things my my partner doesn't love is when I um, I'll go out and meet rolfers for you know drinks or dinner or whatever or, or guilds SI people, and can just talk about the work and we just talk we just learn from each other because we're we're saying the same thing but in different ways and and we're just get, adding new new colors to our palette of like oh I never thought of it in that exact way you know you're saying the same thing but spin it just slightly and you see you see something entirely different which is is you know it's for me is so fascinating my wife finds it exhausting and boring but <laughs> I, I i don't <laughs> there there was a i think um during my training we were there was some quote where it's basically like as long as there's two rolfers in the room that's all you're going to talk about like you won't you won't really talk about other stuff it's guaranteed if, if you you have two si people that they're just gonna, they're gonna do and just feel bad for anyone else around you <laughs> and in in that same way um we all we all have different styles in our work you know some people work very very lightly some people have a more direct touch and that's okay you know the intention is the same and that if, as long as you're looking for some connection to the other person, like a deep connection to your client, as, as long as you're not just treating the other person as an object, which you need to fix, then it doesn't make any difference how you work. And this is somehow yeah. also what comes out in these stories, you know, because people were touched differently. I was touched differently than... Oh, I think we've, we lost Alesh a little bit in the middle of that story. We, we lost you a bit, Alesh. It faded oh. out. You stopped that I was touched differently, which is not the best way to, okay, I was, the, I was, way to end the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was touched. I was touched differently by it than than David David was, and than Nilsi Silvera was, and you know, and, and of course, as a well, at least we got farther this time in getting cut than um, I was touched differently. Are we still in the same stuck in the same loop? We we got a little further, so we know a little bit more about how you were touched differently. <laughs> well, it's a hotel wireless here, so. Uh... <laughs> well, so let me ask as well about this. We'll mention this at the end, but where or how do people find the book? Oh, there is a. You can go just to the to the to our website rolfguild.eu, and there's a link there to how you can preview and and purchase the book. All right, well, we'll link that as well on on the show notes, so we can drive those sales up. Because because it is, you know, I, I joke about selling, but it is. I think it it's a great book. I think it is. It's really helpful both for new practitioners in some way, but I actually really think it's, really, it's so helpful for people. Yeah, okay, you've been a year or two. That's great. But I think you've been doing this for 10 or 15 years. What a great way to refresh your view. That's an interesting um, inquiry of where where this would probably um, be best read in someone's journey with the work. Because like you said in a last that you said, you could just easily pick it up. It's not really like a story from from front to back. But I, I, I haven't thought of this until Andrew just talked about it. But I, I don't know. I'd be curious of what y'all's thoughts are. But I, I feel like after I've been doing this for so long, that it does help enrich the more of the the spirituality around the work and less about the the science, even though that's obviously very important. But um, I, I, by being in Boulder and being a Rolf Movement practitioner, I have a lot of students who are going through the through the training at the Rolf Institute. 
come and see me for various things and mentoring. And because the beginning, the foundation is so heavy on the anatomy and the 10 series and the recipe and kind of like kind of the analytical part of it. And they get kind of anxious of like, Oh, I don't know my anatomy. Am I going to pass the test and this and that? And I'm like, well, all that's important. And I'm not dismissing that, but you got to come back to like, it's about understanding systems and fascial planes and being present and being in, in diet in like this tissue dialogue with your client and not so much of like muscle actions, insertions and things like that. So I kind of talk them off the ledge a little bit of, you know, remember while you're in this, because it's not because you you want to become an anatomy whiz. Some people come out of the work, you know, training and really kind of geek out on that. But just kind of remind them of the, the essence of the work. And um, and I think this book does does speak to that of 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 a balance of the analytical, but also the very metaphysical nature of structural integration. Well, maybe maybe the the book about John about the John Lodge material could even inspire some people to read the original book by Ida Rolf. Um, I'm sometimes really a little bit shocked that I get the sense that. People don't read that anymore. I haven't read. Which it. which book is the which are you saying is the original? Well, either of the integration of human structures. I mean, the book she wrote herself, and for which John Lodge did all the drawings. Um, I get the sense that you know many people just haven't even read that. I agree. Yeah, and I agree. I, I know when I trained with them, they didn't even mention the book ever. It was never mentioned. Yeah, but is is that book different than reestablishing the natural alignment? And no, this, this is the same book. This it's is the same one, just rechanged. Rechanged yeah, yeah, the, the name. Title yeah. was changed all the way along. But yeah, the funny that- funny story. I actually own both of those because I I bought because we were we were recommended in my training to read to reestablishing the natural alignment, and and then later I went through a deep dive of like okay I want to get as many books and I saw this book with the other title and I bought it. And then I opened it and said, wait a minute, this is, this it's looks a, familiar. It's the same yeah. book. Yeah. yeah. Same. Okay. Just making sure. Yeah. Yeah. So in my program, we were, we weren't forced to, but we were highly encouraged to read it. I don't know if everyone did, but we were, we were mentioned to read it. I've sometimes, I mean, just imagine somebody studying Carl Jung and never have a, uh, read a Carl Jung book. I mean, does that make any sense? I mean, to me, it really doesn't. So at least you ought to have read one book by the original founder of the work. You know? Well, yeah. I, I know I, this was the case for me is I read it in my early trainings and then and then it just is in part of my library. But after I finished this book, I am inspired to go back and well, read it. If that happens, then it's great because I yeah. think... This is Ida Rolf wrote, wrote a fantastic book. You know, her the original book is the 10 series. If you will, it's coded. It's coded in a way that only a practitioner of structural integration will understand it. Okay. And it's absolutely fantastic, but you can you can find the entire 10 series in that book. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, I also really think of um, I think of this book very similar. There's a book by Dr. James Jealous, who is the uh, one of the the sort of pioneer thought thinkers in terms of biodynamic osteopathic work, and he wrote a book called I think it's called an Osteopathic Odyssey. I forget the name, but it's a small uh, book. It's a little smaller than yours. Beautiful cover, and it's sort of similar. Where it's you could pick it up. You don't have to read it cover to cover. You could pick it up, pick any page, read that 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 drop of that. And have a lot to sit with for for a period of time. And there's something very similar in in these books to me, where it's yes, you you can read it. There's great information every page, but you can also have it as like I'm going to take the book out today, see where my finger lies is when I open the page up, and what does this want to tell me? And I uh, I love both aspects. I love reading a book cover to cover and getting that, and I also love the aspect of like the the haiku, the zenness of it. As I'm going to just take a piece out. And sit with that. I mean, with the John Lodge book, you can definitely do that. You can just open it anywhere and just read a little yeah. bit, and it'll it'll exactly. tell you something. 
exactly you know, for, for that day definitely that's very similar to me which i think is great maybe we can talk about one more thing but um i'm i'm still contemplating what to do with all the material now you know i'm a little um for me it doesn't make any sense to keep it in my attic for or not, actually it's not in an attic it's actually in a room which my wife and me have started calling the archive you know <laughs> but um so i'm 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 still a little unsure um it 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 doesn't seem to make any sense to keep it in my house only um so i i was for a while i was thinking we should um we could create an, an an exhibition which we could you know the schools could just have it for six weeks and then they would send it on to the next school because i don't know it, it is really different if you go to a museum and see the actual piece of work like either also original handwriting than if you see a picture of it on the internet it is really a different physical experience you know but i really i like that idea that you know when i what was weird is when i when i told that idea to some people actually most of them said don't do that it'll get stolen yeah, you know, and I was a little shocked because I never thought about it that way. I never thought about, you know, you have an exhibition somewhere at some school and somebody cracks open the, 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 the frame cover and steals a piece of original handwriting by either of. I, I, I never thought about it that way. But Well, but it's funny. My, my first thought was <laughs> don't do it. But my first thought was like, good luck getting the schools to, to talk well, to each other. <laughs> Right. Well, well that's, that's so uh, funny. We're all having that because I thought, so I thought what a great way of using this as like a traveling exhibit as weaving peace through right. all the schools again. That or, was my thought, you know, what could, Yazi could just organize it, you know, and, and yeah, uh, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. You know, we would have a big crate and there would be just, you know, frames and there would be behind glass. And maybe, I mean, if you're afraid of it being stolen, you could lock the, the frame even or something. I mean, sure and then maybe a nice. Rottweiler that will sniff out anybody stealing. <laughs> <laughs> and her name will be Ida. <laughs> no, but I mean, that, that actually, you know, one possibility to start with is with three EOC of, maybe even making this a part of the next uh, symposium that's in person. And then sort of like having a, there's this, and we're going to be distributed, distributing it through certain schools as well. So we'll have it on show here as a highlight and then moving it around from there. I, mean, I don't know how that all would work, but. It, well, having it at the next symposium is actually maybe really a good, uh, we're going to have it at our symposium in Prague next year, obviously. Um, right. Then we could have it at the Yazi symposium. That's maybe a good idea. I don't know when when and where is that scheduled? Let's talk to the Yazi about that. Okay, okay, you don't know. I'm not, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if it, I'm not sure. Um, but I think that that's a, that's a great way person. because yeah, I, I don't know if it's in person for next year or not, hopefully. I mean, depends on if we're up to the gamma or the uh, you know epsilon variant at that point. Well, <laughs> maybe it'll be Omega by then and uh, John and, you know, in <laughs> over with. Yeah, I mean, it might be a good way to go with that because the EOC is such a, is that interconnected area of where word can trickle down as well. It's because oh. if somebody has any better ideas, listen to this podcast, we're open to suggestions. You know, this is kind of my take at the moment, what to do with it. But maybe there's other other ideas which are just as good. Well, I'm kind of drifting off about the the actual exhibit, but one thing that just came to mind for me, which would be fun, is to help create a little bit more buzz around the book, is creating maybe um, a book club around reading this and we're going back to the Rolfing, reestablishing the neutral alignment. And kind of opening up the discussions again around the Ida Rolf's original book. Cause I know people read it and it's kind of that first introductory book, but then you get so um, 
you drink the Kool-Aid and you're, you want every book that's out there around structural integration. I feel like that one kind of gets lost in the in the library because then people get hungry for like the books that are about technique and those type of books. So I think I would be into it of having a book club or some kind of continual study discussion around around these two books and bring yeah. bring back yeah. the the juiciness the spiritual metaphor metaphorical vibe that's that Ida Roth brought to the structural integration yeah well I even I even think take that and kind of tie that in with the other thought is maybe that becomes a an ALC thing of like let's have a, an ALC book club where people from different schools, because I, I do think it's really important that the different thoughts come together in a pot. And so you can see this and, and share with different ways. I mean, inter-school is fine as well, but I just think if we could have some sort of way of just, again, creating this bigger framework, this bigger talk, because we do have so much in common, all coming from the founder of the, this work, right? But maybe I'm a dreamer. Uh, we're all dreamers in our ways, in our own ways, I think. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this work. I mean, we're not the, you know, we're optimistic, forward-oriented, change-oriented people, at least most of us. I feel like we've really covered a lot. And we, we've mentioned where people can find the book, and, and we'll post that again. Uh, and, and we're leaving doors open for people listening to contact us, whether it's Nikki, me, or Alesh. We'll leave Margaret out because she's busy enough with her private practice. But if they want us to move this forward, you can contact us and we can work with that. Is there anything else that either of you really feel like we didn't get across, want to share, or we did get across, but you want to highlight again? I'm curious for Margaret, your point of view, if you had a magic wand of what would happen, and considering that it, you've been the, the, the keeper your garage has been the keeper or your attic of this and, and you having the intimate relationship with John, where, what would you like to see happen with the work with the archives or what do you think John would? Yeah. I mean, I think Alice's idea about making an exhibit is a good one. I, 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 I cannot think of anything really. I, I mean, the book is amazing. We'll find out about it and read it. I mean, the, the, the problem in some ways is it is material that interests in the whole world may be potentially, what, 5,000 people max? <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, <laughs> we um, never, you never know. I mean, I think there's probably more interest than we probably realize. It's just the languaging and, you know, I'm kind of coming back to like, I mean, it does not lend itself like what you were saying. That's about being, having, see it and like kind of having that in present versatile response to it. But could be cool to, in the meantime, because we're still not really traveling back to normal of being in person. Maybe right, a virtual exhibit. Is, right, but what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying, it does. It's, it's not material that is of much interest. I don't think outside of the SI community. I, I, you know, I don't think so. At least, you know, that someone who's not connected with SI in any way would be interested in either Rolf's handwriting or John's drawings. I, I, I don't think so. But maybe I'm wrong. So there's a limited scope from what I can tell. I, I, yeah, I think maybe some trickle, like some branches into the somatic. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. But it's not something that the general public at large is going to be greatly interested. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> there's that optimism you spoke about. Yes. Yeah, it should go to the Smithsonian. It becomes like that. <laughs> well, did you ever contact the Smithsonian about that? or? No. No, my husband, Lee, would have done it. He kept asking me, should I contact them? Should I contact them? But, you know, I was going by my intuition. It didn't feel like, no, it didn't feel like that we should do that. Well, this this can start to become the new, instead of the Smithsonian, we have the Rolfsonian. <laughs> Rolfsonian, yes. 
Very good. <laughs> you need a roll, Sonia. <laughs> Well, it's been it's been really great having this conversation. I look forward to the response that that comes from it from from others and seeing where where this grows and, and you know where this sort of takes the work. And I only see positive things coming, and I'm just excited to to help spearhead that some more. I'm just really grateful for both of your time, not just for today, but in the process that has been of from finding that material to making the book to whatever comes next. So thank and you. I, do, I, I do think there are, no matter what level you're at with structural integration, you will get something, or you will get a lot of it. You just hear it in a different way. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely agree. You will at least be touched by 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 the soul of what Ida Rolf's work uh, was and is about. Yeah. Well, I have to extend deep gratitude to Margaret for uh, patiently waiting for the right opportunity to to share this treasure that you had, and that um, that you really honored that this material was so precious, and really waited for the right person to do something with it and alas i'm grateful for you for for pioneering the book and making something creating something really beautiful and i think this is going to be a great great piece of literature for for the si community so deep gratitude and thanks to both of you for uh making this happen well, thank you both for having the opportunity to do a podcast about it and to help to promote it that way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. And wishing you both a great day out there. Thanks for listening to us at Touching Into Presence. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation. You can find out more about this book at rolfguild.ch slash johnlodgebook.html. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd appreciate if you'd leave a positive review of the podcast and subscribe to it to the platform of your choice. When you do this, it really helps other people find us, and we greatly appreciate your support. We look forward to hearing back from you and seeing you on our next conversation at Touching Into Presence. Bye-bye.